Thanks. Okay. Good. Yes. Okay, should we should we wait another minute or should we I think we always run out of time. So I think we can yeah. start with the let's let's get started. Um I'm gonna do a, a quick intro. Um and then I will have Ingo take over. Um, as I mentioned already in passing, Ingo, uh, our founder at Binomics, has over 12 years experience in, in pricing and RGM. Um, he also wrote his dissertation in strategy. So today's topic is right up his alley. And uh, he also developed the Binomics method. Um, and I'm Paul, I'm head of sales at Binomics. Um, I am basically the first point in contact if you want to become a partner or a client of Binomics. And, um, I lead the content and insights as well. Uh, previously worked in, in consulting. If you go to the next page, we can do uh, just a round off that um, company intro. Um, Binomics, for everyone who does not know us, um, is a, a revenue management and pricing software which allows you to make better, faster, and more accurate decisions. Um, the four um, value pillars, as we like to call them, are uh, you can see here on the right, and I'm happy to talk more about it if you uh, would like a one-on-one -on -one demo. Uh, just shoot me an email or um, a direct message here in the chat. If you go to the next slide, I think uh, we just have a quick intro on, on where we are globally, um, so quite a global exposure as well. Our clients often ask us, but can you do this type of data? Have you worked with this market? And I would say we've seen quite a diverse set of markets and so far seen great successes there. So um, I always like sharing this, um, this, uh, this slide to see uh, how far um, we've also come globally. But uh, with no further ado, I'd like to jump right into the content for today. And as I mentioned earlier, Ingo um, and strategy and pricing and RGM experts will talk about exactly those topics today. Uh, so Ingo, with no further ado, um, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Paul, and I hope uh, I can uh, satisfy your expectations in this one here. Um, yeah, let's let's get started. So I think um, we today we combine essentially two two concepts: uh, pricing, revenue growth management on the one side, and then strategy on the other. And I think it makes good sense to first um, introduce both concepts and then then merge them and and see what comes out of it. Uh, I think. Um, quite interesting. I hope we also have here and there a few stories um, um, to, to make the, the, the Friday morning or afternoon a bit more interesting. All right, so let's get started. Um, I think a little disagreement probably on this slide. So what's revenue growth management and pricing all about? It's essentially around uh, the way we understand it more broadly, five different topics or questions. Um, and we're Typically, in this case, it's a consumer goods case. So we're looking at the product category, chocolate here, um, for example, at a retailer or in a country. And the, the typical questions we need to ask, um, what should be the prices for my products? Uh, should it be 65 cents? Should it be a euro? Should it be more or less? Then what products should I offer? Pack price architecture, should I... Um, sell single bars of chocolate? Should I combine them in, in two bars? Should I have a combination of, of all of this? How should I promote my products? So should I always sell at the same price? Um, have I, should I have, for example, like an everyday low price strategy or should I work with promotions? And then of course, how should that align with, with the trade terms? So how, how, do, how should the benefits be split between the manufacturer and the retailer? And of course, what makes this all even more challenging and, and difficult is that um, to best manage or drive that car, all of these things should be done um, together and they should be well coordinated. So if you increase a price that has an effects on the pack price architecture, or it might also have um, effects on, on what promotions work better. Um, and of course, there are many peculiarities um, that we have to work with in pricing is so how does it affect price thresholds? Um, what if I um, 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 move through price threshold? What's, what's the effect of that, for example, and many more things. And what makes all of this even more difficult, of course, is that the world we're living in is, is changing. And particularly, I would say that in the past years, we have seen an increase 
in, in, in challenges and we want to, um, moving forward, I think just pick one, which it seems to me from the, the, the conversations we have is, is the most prominent one, uh, the one we put on in the first spot here, inflation. So we'll have a deeper look into that and what that means for revenue growth management and pricing in particular. But overall, I think that the key challenges we've been, we're facing are um, inflation. So uh, had a few years with very low inflation, in most parts of the world. Now we have increasing inflation, and it's it's not clear how that how that continues. Uh, if it stays high, it goes even higher, or or might drop down to to previous levels again. Then we have uh, a number of um, regular uh, regulatory changes uh, in the UK, for example, HFSS. So um, limitations on what can be done with products that um, have higher contents of sugar, salt, fat, for example, we have topics like carbon tax uh, in the automotive industry. I think here in the, US, in the, in the EU, we, we, it was just a law passed that makes it illegal to sell combustion engines after uh, some point in the, in the 2030s, I think 35. So all of these changes have massive or can have massive effects on, on portfolios. And um, the job of revenue growth managers, pricing managers, of course, is understanding how to best deal with these changes and, and also changes that come from the global pandemic um, that um, I think has become less relevant, but um, might, might pick up again in, in the fall. And that always has effects on um, on on the market. Um, and I think uh, while I'm already talking about market, for example, one effect that also just happened is when we look, uh, and I think most aren't fully aware of these these trends, is um, that on the capital markets until probably the end of last year, um, growth was highly valued compared to profitability in. In stock prices and that that has seen some shift towards now with increasing um, interest rates a more fo a stronger focus on on profitability um, compared to long-term stronger growth and that has played i would say favorably on the stock prices of many consumer goods companies less favorably on the stock prices of many tech companies. So these are all things that that are important. And in particular, this last point, the, the trade off between profit, revenue, growth is something that's very close to, to the workings of a, a pricing or revenue growth manager. So these are important topics. And it's important that we keep keep this in mind as we talk about the topics. And of course, it's important to understand how to address them also strategically. <clears throat> so when we talk about strategy, uh, it's of course important to understand what, what we mean by strategy. Um, and I think the, the central axis where people have an understanding of strategy is somewhere between trickery and, and formal planning. So they understand price as strategy as, as, as trickery. I think my favorite quote here is um, strategy is when you're out of ammunition, but you keep right on firing uh, so that the enemy won't know it, right? So um, th I think that that captures the, 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 the meaning of pricing as trickery. And we see that also, or many of us, I think, have a temptation to play this part um, also in pricing to undercut a competitor and, and or try short-term things um, in, in telecommunications, increase the data volumes without notice of products, um, and to essentially gain a short-term benefit uh, in, in the competitive game. But the question is always, um, how does that play out long-term? Because I think in, in most of our industries, um, we're, we're not involved in, 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 in single games. So you, you make a move in many industries, competitors can benefit from a short-term price decrease, for example, at the cost of the competitors, but it's very unclear how that plays out in the long term. And there, if, if that's what you want to do, decrease prices to uh, gain market share, for example, then you need to have a good understanding how that plays out in the long run. Do you really have a cost advantage to um, play that for the required period of time, for example? So the, these are important questions. Um, also, quote, I think we most know on, on strategy as planning is I think everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. 
um, that also highlights the difficulty of actually of actually planning ahead and having a good understanding of what to do. And I think uh, particularly in pricing, um, and this is the, the topic that we're covering at, at Binomics, is that not everything, but many elements of pricing, what we do in pricing can actually be understood at a much better degree than with many of the standard tools like, <clears throat> like a price elasticity, for example. And we will take a look at that now in the context of, um, of inflation. Before that, I think, um, and Paul mentioned that I've spent quite some time in, in, in strategy. I think one of the, the most useful frameworks um, I, I've seen for thinking strategically is the one um, <clears throat> comes from Richard Rommel, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, uh, a book on strategy that I highly recommend. It's very entertaining to read uh, and, and, and highly insightful. And I think that the one of the course frameworks out of that is the one that we're showing here. So <clears throat> to, to do good strategy always involves um, three steps. First, the diagnosis, understanding what the challenge is, understanding, for example, what, what inflation means, then setting a proper guiding policy, uh, like an overarching idea uh, of how to solve the problems. And then you need coherent action to implement um, that, that strategy. And let me just explain this in a, in a classical example, um, <clears throat> what that means in practice. And this is one of the, the short stories I promised. Um, so, and I'll use the, the classical example of David and Goliath. I think we all know the story, but I think it, from a strategic point of view, it has a different angle than uh, how the story is typically told. Um, and <clears throat> with, with, I would say with strategy, it's like with great art, it's really difficult to find, define what good strategy is, but it's immediately obvious once you see it, uh, but maybe in some cases, you only see it in hindsight. Um, and here, I think the example of David and Goliath is very, a very useful illustration of that. So I think one, one aspect of the story of David and Goliath is that um, before the fight started, David was offered a piece of armor as a protection against Goliath because uh, people are standing around were thinking, so he's so, so weak and small. Uh, he needs some protection and David uh, rejected that armor. And here's the strategic thinking that led to that decision. So first diagnosis, so we're in, in our framework. Um, so from how, how does the situation look from, from David's point of view? So he sees that Goliath is the strongest man in the world and considered undefeatable. So that's a threat. Um, whereas I'm weak, obvious a weakness, uh, but I'm pretty fast with and good with the slingshot and no one knows about that. So that's my, my core strengths. And also I've detected a spot in Goliath armor where he's unprotected right between his eyes. So that's the strategic opportunity. And together, this is a, I would say a classical example of the SWOT analysis that, that David went through here. Um, so that's the diagnosis uh, via SWOT analysis. And now the guiding policy. So his, David's thinking is, okay, I can beat him if I can hit him with my slingshot before he comes too close to me. Therefore, I need to be agile and get one good shot at him. That's my only chance here. Okay, that's the guiding policy. And coherent action then is, I need to reject the armor because it wouldn't offer me sufficient protection in case Goliath comes too close, but it would make me slower and... Uh, um, mitigate my, my strategic advantage here. So I need to focus all my attention on my first and probably only shot. So that's, a, I would say, a, a, a very good example of strategic thinking. And let's see how we can use similar strategic thinking for our pricing challenges as well. So, and let's do this with the case of inflation. Um, and here we start essentially with the diagnosis part. So um, in our experience, inflation isn't just, just one number. So it's not just the 8% inflation we have in the US or 7% inflation we have in the European Union, for example. But inflation, as it is relevant for pricing, happens in, in different stages. So you typically have the immediate inflation or the immediate effects 
For example, you have cost increases um, that are higher uh, in some areas. Some raw materials have increased much stronger than others for, for certain reasons. Um, so you have cost increases that, that can be highly different across different product categories. <clears throat> and as a result of that, you might have competitor price changes. So those are the immediate effects, but immediately, typically, you don't have a change in customer preferences that that typically takes a bit longer so th those would be more medium uh, effects and these would affect um, so consumers change their behavior because of increasing gas prices they maybe have to have less money to spend in other other areas and that might affect their um, their, their demand functions for categories that maybe you are responsible for. And then those are midterm effects. So after essentially customers or, or shoppers have reacted to the inflation environment, and then I think the more long-term effect is that you have like a systemic change that companies change their operations. They have maybe, they go from annual price changes to quarterly price changes. Um, so that is something that's very difficult to get, get rid of in the long run. And you have um, uh, shoppers essentially going through nominal wage increases um, and then a persistent increase of, um, of their willingness, nominal willingness to pay for certain products. And um, in countries that have been in inflation for a longer time, you see that once that has started, that's very, very difficult to get rid of. Um, and for pricing managers, it's important to understand these different stages and understand what the implications are. Um, as a simple example, <clears throat> if in the case where we only have a cost increase on our side or maybe also of the competitors but we don't have a change in the demand function um, so we have let's say the two most commonly used candidates in, in pricing linear demand here and exponential demand with exponential demand you have uh, constant price elasticity um, and in both cases you can compute the optimal price increase after a cost increase um, under the condition that the previous price has been profit optimal. And one thing that we, we stress quite often is the fact that, as you can see here in the example, if the costs increase from 100 euros to 110 euros, so a 10% cost increase, before the cost increase at a price elasticity of minus two, the um, profit optimal price is 200 because if you only have one product to focus on, margin times price elasticity needs to be minus one. Uh, the question is, how do you pass on um, this cost increase? In the case of linear demand, you increase your price by 5%. You pass on half of the absolute price uh, cost increase. And in the case of exponential demand, you keep your essentially keep your margin stable. So you, you maintain the 50% margins. So as cost increase from 100 to 110 euros, you go from 200 to 220 euros. So the implications are, are massively different. Um, if I, I was a consultant and um, your cost increased by 10% and I said, okay, you need to increase your price by somewhat something between five and 20%, um, uh, sorry, uh, not percent here, it's, uh, it's because we're, so it would be between 2.5% and 10%, th that answer is not very helpful. Um, and um, so we, we actually need to be better. So uh, then, then just knowing the price elasticity, we actually need to know, even in the simples of all possible cases, have an understanding of, of what demand actually looks like in this case. Um, and let me just highlight what this could look like. And for this, I need to switch my screen. Paul, can you tell me if this works? Yeah, I cannot see anything yet, but... Just down to three and... <laughs> it... <laughs> Fingers crossed. And it should be there. Yeah. I can okay, see it. perfect. So uh, very simple example, I think, uh, based on an on a example that we're using sometimes in, in, uh, in, in webinars, 
so it's a simplified industry, but also already has some some complexity. We have we sell uh, peanuts, um, different sizes. We have competitors who also sell nuts, uh, at different pack sizes, and um, so we have between 1,000 and 250 gram, and we sell them at different prices. Um, we also have some, some realism in here in the sense that we have certain trade terms with our, uh, with our retailers. We have costs and um, we have list, current list prices. And um, what we want to understand is how that um, would look like in the market. And the technology underneath it is, um, and uh, if you're more interested, happy to discuss and also show on our website, is the virtual shopper um, technology. And the idea is that this offer is shown to a set of virtual shoppers that behave like real customers, like real shoppers. And um, when you change something in the offer, the price, for example, some of them, like real people, change what they would buy. So if we look here at the difference, I increase the price here by 20 cent, and then we lose these 107 customers. And some of them, like in reality, go to buy other of our own products. Some go here to a competitor. So this is a much more realistic picture of, um, of what's really going on in the market. And you can see, so in this case, we have a very high uh, elasticity because um, we only change one, the price of one product <clears throat> if we change the price also of the closest alternative, you already see that elasticity um, goes down for this first product here. And um, other things that are very easy to see is that in, in reality, price elasticities are not really stable. They, they change with price changes. And you can, with, with something like this, you, you have a much more realistic picture of, of what happens also between products and you can, also, um, for example, look at different cases of ways to react to a, a, a cost increase in inflation. So uh, already prepared some cases. So here's the base case before our cost increase. Then we have a cost increase of 20%. Everything else in our portfolio stays the same. Um, so then we still sell the same units, but have less profit because our costs have increased. And alternatives might be that we increase our price by 20%. See, this is the effect of that. If our competitors follow as well, then customers or shoppers have fewer alternatives um, and fewer of them switch the product. Or we can also look here, um, if we're, look, we're dealing with inflation, what happens if I don't increase my price but degram my product? So we go from 250 to 200 grams from uh, 500 to 400 and so on. And then I see that in this case, I will and stay at the same prices that we have certain unit um, implications, profit implications and everything else. And we can also look at this, for example, from a market share point of view, um, <clears throat> where I see that um, we, if, Everyone else follows, for example, the price change that we gain a little bit in market share, whereas when no one follows, no one else follows that we lose a bit in market share. So, um, or uh, sorry, um, in, in sales, we, we lose a bit uh, to be correct here. So um, we see that with, with the technology like this, and I'll go back to the presentation. Um, this just as a small small example that with the proper technology we can do the the diagnosis uh, very elaborately and can look at many many cases so with the first diagnosis then usually what um what has to happen uh, from a strategic point of view when you actually work with these concepts in reality is you always have to go through some strategy framework uh, this here is the one that we have been using for for quite some time and and find very helpful in um, then actually implementing the the proper pricing or revenue growth management strategies. I think we have it on our website if you're interested, um, and you can also ask the colleagues uh, if they can send it to you. So typically, the the major challenges you have are once you have understood the the the, um, the diagnosis, you need to have the the guiding policy 
in your framework. So you need to define the proper objectives. What I, what I can't I, see your presentation at the moment. Not sure. When did, are you seeing it now? Uh, no. I stopped sharing. Okay. Um, what did you see? Uh, you went out of the demo and then ah. There. Ah, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, thanks for the for the hint. Um, so after the just once one sentence. Um, after the diagnosis, um, the next step in the framework is the, the, the guiding policy. So what are my objectives? Are we aiming for profit maximization? Are we aiming to increase our market share or revenue? These things need to be defined, typically also then broken down by, by retailer or category to get an understanding. Um, and then also understand, and this is, I would say, uh, also more in the traditional uh, view be before the technologies we, we now have available, um, you would typically say, okay, we can increase, uh, if our costs increase, we will only react with the price increase, we will not degram our products and so on. So these need, the, the measures that can be taken typically need to be defined as a, as a guiding policy. And once that's done, the implementation goes through specific decisions, um, increase the price from five to six euro, for example, having the proper KPIs to measure this. Um, and of course, the, the infrastructure, the tools, the, the data organization to actually implement it, particularly some implementing something like a change in the promotion plan can require a larger team and a sales team to go through that with the different retailers. So I think this is very straightforward, but it's an important and integral part of strategy. Um, and we, we also have the details of how that can play out and also how that can interact with, with technology. And I think one of the key benefits of a technology like the one I just showed is that um, many of the complexities, and here's I think that the core complexity of how to deal with prices, products, promotions, trade terms, um, <clears throat> where traditionally companies work with guidelines where they say, okay, we can only work with prices or if we um, increase the price but lose too, expect to lose too much sales, uh, we will rebalance by an increase in the promotions that we run. So here companies typically work with um, broad guidelines or, or not broad, but very strict guidelines. And these can be to some extent resolved with technology uh, is in the case that I just showed. And um, <clears throat> I think, and this is my last point before we go to the, before the Q&A, is that that's one of the, in, in terms of the strategy, one of the key developments that we're going through right now. Um, because many of the things um, that were considered strategic in the past, um, as highlighted by this, this chess example, chess uh, strategic game, of course, but many of the elements that have been solved with heuristic, uh, for heuristics, for example. So for example, the, the chess position here on the left side, uh, the Lucina position is um, to, to it's white, white has a winning strategy. Um, and as a human player, you need to know how to essentially build a bridge with the, with the rook here. So to defend the other rook and, and um, uh, move through with the pawn and, and so on. So these these were things that had to be solved with um, with the strategy, uh, the proper techniques, as in, in pricing as well. But to a computer, this challenge looks much different, right? To a computer, this is just a simple optimization problem, and the computer sees that there's a force check made in, in 21 moves. Um, and what we're saying is that many of the things that were considered strategic in the past are now more an optimization problem that can be handed over to a computer uh, for simulation as we, we just showed and uh, for pricing or revenue growth managers um, that means that they can focus more on the real strategic elements how does the competition react for example um, how does that work out in the broader context of the company and so on. But the, the pure computation can be delegated to a machine. And here's just one example um, that comes from our work. Um, and the question was, <clears throat> would it make sense to go from a high-low promotion strategy? So some weeks with a reduced price, large sales, some weeks with a, with a high price, lower sales, to a case where you have an everyday low price. 
and what you can do with the technology like the one I showed is predict very precisely what that means in the market. So going from high low to everyday low price would be in these implications for sales. Um, and you see, still see these ups and downs that come from the um, price changes in competitor products that, that stayed with a high-low strategy. So that's why there's still some up and down. It's important to, to know and anticipate uh, to evaluate such a strategy. And in this case, the company gained about 50% in sales volumes, but almost half of that came from the other products. So there's a lot of complexity in these systems. And now with technology, it can be taken over. And we as managers have time to um, work on the truly strategic elements and give all the computational uh, difficulties to the machine. Paul? Perfect. I uh, just uh, was chatting with someone uh, here. We have a lot of questions that came in. So um, let's, let's maybe tackle some of those. Um, I think we're... Um, should we, I think we're through with, with the half hour that we set out, but we, I think we can go, I don't know, um, for another five or so minutes to answer the questions. Yeah. Everyone who's interested, so, sorry for taking a minute too long. Um, everyone who's interested, obviously, uh, feel free to stay and we'll go through and I don't know, another five minutes to the questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So someone was asking, um, I think that was in the beginning when you were speaking about inflation. Um, it was I was posing a hypothesis. Might it be that consumers react on inflation and with inflation expectations much faster this time? Um, I.e., will they move more to private label brands? Um, I guess this is kind of a um, question about research, maybe that we've done, but also probably hypothesis. Yeah, um, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I haven't. I haven't seen that in, in our work so far, but the, the private label question also has some important strategic dimensions. One is private label typically has lower margins, so they uh, it's they have fewer options when costs increase. So they 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 need to increase their prices much faster. So that that's the one question, the the one element. But the other one is um, the, the the chance to get rid of a private label is probably very low because um, they're of, of course closely related, uh, related to, to retailers and even if uh, during an inflation they, they might not do as well or might do better it's really difficult to they, they, they won't leave the market so th these are strategic considerations that that are important um, in relation to private labels but coming back to your original question um, that might be, but we, we haven't seen it, and I would expect it to be different in across different industries. So with more expensive uh, investment type products, new TVs or so, uh, you, I would expect this earlier than than in, in uh, fast moving consumer goods, for example. All right, and um, then someone is asking, uh, maybe on a on a country level basis, someone's asking what would be the framework or step-by-step -step in countries or specific markets where you don't have reliable market information. So I'm assuming it's more about the implementation of these frameworks on the ground. Yeah. So um, there are, I mean, the, the, the data quality, of course, plays an important role. Um, you, you, the, the framework, I would say, stays essentially the same, but the the, the specific values or the specific elements um, in these steps is affected. Uh, what if, if there's fewer data available, that essentially means yet that your predictions are, might not be as good. Uh, here also, um, with for example, with the solution we have is you can, if you have a larger country, France, for example, and a maybe similar country, Belgium, with less information, you can also use insights from the larger country. Um, as a basis for the for the smaller countries, so there are statistical techniques I would say that allow you to do that, and there's also I would say one of the larger benefits of of uh, such a technology also to help in countries with with less information. Yeah, and then maybe in the interest of time, I'll combine two questions. So um, someone is asking what kind of data is required by the tool, and someone else is asking whether we can include conjoint information. 
and how we integrate this as an input. Um, and maybe if I yeah. can answer this uh, quickly, um, the main data that we use is uh, sales data. So in, in CPG, for instance, sell out data that you get uh, from data providers, but in telco, it could be your direct to consumer data. Um, and uh, in, in telco or software, also A-B test data, and that also includes conjoined information. Um, and the interesting thing about our um, algorithm is that it um, can feed in new information very naturally. So um, the way the algorithm works is that um, it, is, it is quite flexible and on a much more granular level of, um, um, of statistics than uh, a lot of the uh, regression models that are out there. So um, without going into more detail here, um, that's, that's how I would answer that question. It's also asking, can you repeat the name of the um, book about strategy? And um, I answered, happy to share the presentation afterwards. So check your emails, everyone who's in this yeah. meeting, uh, in this webinar, also get it and then you can see see the title as well yeah it's, but um, it, it's a good strategy bad strategy um ah, okay that's the for, for the quick other Google. book that was yeah. not named okay yeah good bad strategy yeah i think um i got that book as well so yeah that was a very good book um and then someone's asking how can we get um price pack simulation and uh, i guess this is uh, from a cpg um, um person um, means change in pack size simulated when we don't have historical data. And in, in other industries, this could be, for instance, uh, the size of gigabytes or, or any other kind of packaging bundling question. So, Inga, do you want to answer very shortly? Uh, we're running quite yeah. out of time. Um, so, so, short answer. So, typically, we see in the market already different pack sizes, maybe from a competitor. Um, certainly, if you have, in, in the example that we showed, you have a kilo, 750. 500 and so on then it's it's we have very good experience with intern extrapolating that um within the range and, and beyond the range so the, these are i would say um established techniques that that we can apply here okay and then um i think that was it um all other questions um we're happy to answer also by email um but i have to jump actually on another meeting um so thanks everyone for joining us today uh, if you have any questions if you want to know more about binomics uh, feel free to shoot us an email otherwise um keep an eye on your inbox we will um, send you this webinar uh recording as well as the presentation in the next few days ingo if you go to the next page i think i also have a couple of more in in the pipeline next one we're planning on the history and future of, of revenue growth management so where it comes from um, and where it's going so uh, it should be quite an interesting one as well thanks everyone and uh yeah speak to you next time thanks paul Bye -bye. thanks everyone um have a have a great weekend uh and see you soon bye